and welcome back to another episode of Once Upon a Nightmare. I am your host Lorraine and firstly before I get into this episode I'd like to just say a big thank you to everyone who has been really supportive since I announced I was going just horror movies. Obviously I'm going to get a little true crime fix in there somehow but I just want to say thanks for all the nice messages and the listens I've had. And talking of horror, this one is a strange one but a great one. Sometimes strange is good. I remember seeing this when it first came out and I did enjoy it, but I definitely needed to have another watch of it for this episode and I was glad I did and I still like it. This week I'm going back to the year 2000. This is The Cell. Do you believe there's a part of yourself that you don't show anybody when I'm inside? I get to see those things. I feel them. These girls were kidnapped, tortured, and murdered. Our killer is a white male, about 30 years old. Carl Rudolph Starger was had the house under surveillance for about 20 minutes. He keeps them in this thing for about 40 hours. And after 40 hours, the water starts. And it doesn't stop. There is a girl that is missing. Her name is Julia Hickson. He is the only one that knows where she is. If he was conscious, do you think that he would tell you where she is? Are you sure? I'm sure. You bring in this monster, and you're asking her to go into that mine. Hey, She's gone very deep into his world. So she's made contact. She's lost. She thinks this is real. I'm going in to get her. came out I don't think it was necessarily a big year for horror movies we of course had Scream 3 The Gift Final Destination the first one Urban Legend Final Cut and Dracula 2000 which I do not remember Dracula 2000 at all and none of them really screams out horror here um Scream 3 maybe I suppose that's probably the, the main one for me I know Final Destination Urban Legend was kind of like a big thing at the time but I wasn't really overly into them I have done an episode on Scream 3 um but the rest of them, I didn't really take much notice of. One thing I did notice, though, um, is that pose they do. The characters, the pose the characters do on the posters. They, like, cram as many people into the poster as they can. And they're all kind of to the side or looking straight on. Um, but having a look at the films that did come out this year, uh, The Cell was actually probably my favourite in terms of horror. It was directed by Tarson Singh and written by Mark Protasevich. It's an 18 and runs for about an hour and 49 minutes. It had a budget of $33 million and made just over $61 million worldwide. It stars Jennifer Lopez as Catherine Dean, a psychologist working on a new therapy that allows her to see what is happening in another person's unconscious mind. A series of bizarre murders are happening that shows that this is the work of a serial killer. It soon comes to light that the perpetrator of these crimes is Carl Rudolf Starger. He's played by Vincent D'Onofrio. Starger himself falls into a coma after kidnapping a young woman and it then becomes a race against time to try and find her before she dies because they know that he doesn't kill them instantly. Catherine, though, is a bit reluctant to go into such unknown territory with a serial killer, but she is pers persuaded by Agent Peter Novak, who is played by Vince Vaughn, uh, to actually go and do it. But then, of course, it all takes a bit of a sinister turn. From the offset with this film, you know you're in for something a bit different. We see this most gorgeous setting. There's a black horse riding through the desert. A woman is on top of it and she's in this most angelic white outfit. But as she dismounts the horse and walks onto the sand, the horse turns into a statue. So it's a bit weird. 
And um, I'll be honest, there's a score playing at this time and I find it really distracting. We have like this beautiful visual, this horse, this woman, and the whole scene is stunning. And then we have this music from Howard Shore and with the masters of musicians of Jajoka. And it's just really chaotic, kind of a bit like jazz because I'm not a fan of jazz. It's very loud and it's all over the place. And it doesn't match the setting, but I guess it matches what is happening at this stage, I suppose. You know, it kind of feels like a bit like a weird dream, makes no real sense. And that's how I feel about the music. I have no idea what's going on and the music make no music makes no sense to me. I can't even hear it because it's that loud and it makes no sense. But the music does eventually calm down, which I appreciated. And we see a young boy. He's got like this stone reflecting off the sun. And the woman we find out is Catherine. And the young boy is Edward Baines, who is played by Colton James. He is in a coma due to a rare form of schizophrenia and she's trying to reach him. So the beginning of the film seems fairly innocuous. They're using a rare form of technology. And while we know there is a killer on the, on the loose, the company providing this service does appear to be working to the well-being of this young boy. And also when we see Catherine, she's in this setting that, you know, is new, but she's not phased by Edward. Even at one point, his face kind of goes distorted, has a bit of a scary look to it. And she doesn't fear it. And the whole thing, you know, doesn't make us fear anything. So for, for at the start, it's pretty tame. Not to last, though. While The Cell is a horror film, at its very core, it's a film more about true crime, which, let's face it, pretty horror-esque. Although while it takes the serial killer true crime s route, it is very different to what I'm used to seeing. Off the top of my head, there's a film called Fear from 1990 with Ali Sheedy. And while she doesn't use technology to enter the mind of a serial killer, she does get to go in there, and he, but he's awake and he knows that she's there. It's very bizarre, but it's a really good idea. It's a great film, terrifying, definitely worth a watch. We tend to see when stuff like this happens, cops, you know, hunt the killer down, they catch them into prison, they hopefully go. But with this film, it's more science fiction meets horror meets fantasy meets true crime. One of the main characters who I mentioned is Carl, and he's quite an interesting character as we flip between disgust at what he's done and the lengths he goes to, but also the young boy he once was. Through the therapy we with Catherine, we get a huge insight into his life as a young child. And I have to say, it's fucking terrifying what that what that boy had to put up with. I personally think he is definitely a product of his own environment. And I know that we tend to say not all kids turn out that way, but everyone's different. Everyone reacts to things differently. And I'm not saying that what he did, what he does as an adult deserves to be excused, but it's really hard not to feel for the boy um, because we see so much of him in here. And we go on that journey with Catherine of the confusion of feeling for the boy, but also trying to break into the mind of this monster. When we see what Starger actually does, yes, he is pure evil. I mean, it's kind of off the chart scary as to what he actually does with his victims. It's not quick. They suffer. The whole process of what he does, it's very drawn out. He he doesn't just hurt them in a physical manner, but the torture he inflicts from a mental capacity is very next level. He likes to turn his victims into dolls. His whole MO was very well thought out and he would need to go to such extremes to firstly get his victims and then of course find a space to perform this really bizarre ritual. There, His victims are selected well in advance, he takes his time, he watches them, usually young women, successful. His tactics on getting them though are quite inventive. The main girl he captures who we see throughout the film is Julia Hickson and she's played by Tara Subkoff. And we wonder, will she survive as Catherine and the FBI race against time to try and find her? And it's very touch and go. It's very intense. We get to know her. So we we want them to get to her and save her. Singh does a good job here of placing her in just enough scenes to get us interested because we don't really know a lot about her, but we go through it with her. From when she is in the cell, not knowing what's going to happen to the water coming in to drown her bit by bit, because what we've saw at the beginning with another victim being in this water chamber and how much water actually goes in, you know, we have the fear of will they get to her before she drowns. We know she will not be fully subjected to the hell that the other victims went through because Stargar's in a coma, but we know enough that it's not going to be good if they don't find her in time. But for Julia, though, she has no idea that he's in a coma. So while trying to save her own life and escape, 
and, you know, not drown, she's got the added fear of the person who did this to her. They may come back and do other things to her. So while she's trying to, like, save herself, she might break out and then run into them. When she is kidnapped, we see what women tend to go through in public to protect themselves. I myself, when walking to my car, especially if it's in a building, um, I do keep a serious eye out. I've got my keys ready. I speed walk to that car. I lock the doors once I'm in it not before having a little glimpse in the back seat. And she does the same. But as she reverses, she hears like a yelp of a dog. And like anyone, they would get out to help. But we know she's being watched. And, you know, the dog is this German shepherd, the albino German shepherd that we know that Starger owns. So we've kind of put two and two together. And she, of course, feels she's hit this dog. And we think like he's a bit of a shit for using his dog like this. But then we realize it's a brick that she's hit and not the dog. And the dog has obviously been trained to do this but for her I would kind of be the same why is this brick here it's a very strange place for it to be and this is where he sees his opportunity and he's able to take her now he takes them to a remote area and has designed obviously this glass chamber that we've seen and you are very unlikely to escape from it but if you were in it you'd, you'd give it a go and we know that it takes about 40 hours for it to slowly fill up with water you no, know, just spurts here and there. But the bizarre thing is they are provided with food, a bed, if you can call it that, a toilet. And it's a bit weird. Like, why bother to make them a little bit more comfortable? Well, I guess that's the part of the whole mindfuck, isn't it? You have basic things provided. You're not killed instantly. Your mind may think there is a chance because every minute you're alive, and especially every minute you don't see the person or nothing's being like physically done to you by that person in person, you may think, I, I could get out of here. I could get out of here. You have to believe that, I suppose, don't you? But he has done this before uh, seven times and no one has survived it. So will the eighth. Now, this whole thing he does after they do die and he brings them home, he washes them down with the bleach to make them look like this doll. There is a scene later on where his dad loses his shit with him because he's playing with dolls. So maybe the whole doll thing is related to that. Anyway, the next bit is kind of what took it to another fucked up level if that's possible. Um, I have mentioned in previous episodes that what obviously two consenting adults do is up to them. No judgment here. You you do you. Although I, I kind of don't get why you would go to this much hassle. Well, I suppose some people need more, don't they, to reach that moment. <laughs> but not only does it look really painful, but, but he's got all those circles on his back, the hooks, and it looks really uncomfortable. And I know sometimes pain is meant to, you know, help you on your way. I'm really bad at explaining this, aren't I? Um, but it's a lot of work and he hoists them up there and, you know, he's he's kind of lying on top of the body, but not on it, on it. And, you know, he's suspended over her and you're, you're kind of thinking there's no way that would keep the weight and it would rip off of your skin and you'd fall down. And no, he, you know, does the business and it's horrifying, but whatever floats your boat, if consensual, I always will add that. So it all takes a drastic turn because the authorities obviously find out who and where he is. But when they go to him, we're kind of used to seeing um, when people go into the SWAT teams, it's very chaotic. It's all fast, which is, it is at the start. They're clear and like running from room to room, gun in the air. And then they kind of find him on the floor, naked, motionless. And I guess they expect to fight, don't they, when they go into a place like this. But he's just in a coma on the kitchen floor. So it's all kind of, time just kind of slows down a little bit here. But the police obviously don't understand the severity of what's going on in his mind and the fact that it's gone. They can't just simply wake him up because he also suffers from a rare form of schizophrenia called Whalen's infraction. And as a child, he was baptized and they kept him under for too long. He had a seizure and this was a result of it. But apparently this isn't a real thing. I Googled it and it's actually nothing to do with the brain. It refers to an incomplete bone fraction and affects bony tissue. So obviously this girl's body is found, the one uh, the one he previously killed, and he's taken another. Starger's in a coma and Catherine has to go and explore his lovely mind. Now this whole setup of where she goes, it's actually quite impressive. It's It's very basic. It's very clean. They're just on a table. They wear these red rubber suits. And they're like ribbed and they're suspended from wires. Starker would love it. You know, the whole wire and in the air thing. Um, Catherine does have a button on her hand so that when she gets herself into these, it gets into these mines, there may be times where she becomes fearful or feel, feel it's not going well. And she can press this 
and they bring her out of it because it's an unknown territory. And especially when you're going into the mind of a serial killer, you don't know what you're going to find. But when she does go into Starker's mind, we really do get the full impact of what he went through as a kid. And it's heartbreaking to watch. And I will say this boy was abused so badly by his father, both mentally and physically. And because of how we see what Catherine's like with children, as in Edward, we know that when she sees Carl as a young boy, it's going to pull on her heartstrings. And it does. And it does on the audience too. I mean, I had to look away at times. Carl's mind when she goes in there, it's very dark and scary. It's an underground chamber. There's no light. There's these really like high, steep steps. Places to fall. It's not safe, which basically is his childhood. His mind is a place where you would not want to be. And we don't really see anything that would suggest any sort of brightness in his life. We see her speak to him, introduce herself and we can see that he's scared. He, you know, he obviously doesn't know why she's there. and But he obviously maybe senses that she's not bad because he does help her in this strange form when we see a horse. It's a very bizarre scene. And it's there's just a horse standing in this um, like veterinary office type thing. And it's very still. It's all very peaceful. It's very clinical looking. And we hear a timer. And then that's when he pushes her. And it's a good job he does because these things shoot down and slice the horse into lots of bits. And we see the organ still going. But he has tried to save her. So therefore, this scene kind of shows us that she's not a threat. But the horse thing is it's weird. And as soon as she, uh, as she follows Carl, she then comes into a room that's really seedy, unsettling, like it's a peep like a peep show, the window, the, the windows go up and we see these dolls. And obviously that's the whole doll thing that he's into. And, you know, there's sexual noises and sexual movements. And we then get taken to Demon Carl. And this scene for me, actually, is really spectacular because up until now, everything's been very dark. It's been wet. It's been grim. And you don't really know where you're going. And then in this room, it's very decorated. <laughs> uh, he rises from a throne, this uh, demon Starger, and he's got this long, beautiful purple trail. Now, when he goes down here, it's not, it's a slight glide, but it's also a frazzled gl glide because he doesn't know who this woman is, where she's come from. We've got all these very dark colors. Um, we've got our reds, reds, our purples, our golds, our blacks, and... There's a lot going on with colour through this film, as I'll say a bit later on. But this version of him is very different to what we see as the film progresses. There's kind of a few different versions of Starger. Here he's scary, anger, angry, and he's almost confused as well. And, you know, the room, as I said, very done up compared to the grimness of, you know, when we first see Carl. So I suppose the grimness is Carl's reality, but Starger's reality is something different, something more grand. And we see this more as Catherine goes deep into his mind. So the next round of therapy, it gets even more intense as we see Catherine in a glass box in that red dress that most people know her from in the film as she uh, floats slowly to the ground. And this is when we really, really get the full impact of what Carl had to go through. And this is within his house. So it starts with him breaking a plate and his father punishes him, hits him in the head with a spoon and, you know, he's always telling him he's worthless. He's screaming at him. There's a woman in the room that kind of looks out of it. And, you know, he he's very inappropriate around her with Carl. And then we see him, you know, he's been playing with dolls. And he says that his son is the F word for playing with dolls and beats him with a belt. Not before finishing him off with an iron. And Catherine has to view all this and she can't get out. And what makes things like this so hard to watch personally is the fact that you know that there's you know, pricks out here that actually do stuff for like like that. You know, they're so pathetic. They're such a coward to go after a young boy. And I'm sure if his son was as big as the rock, he might have uh, different things. But, you know, if you beat your kids, you're a piece of shit. So simple as. Um, as we dive further and further into Carl's mind, you know, we get to see the other side of how he is. So we see the young, innocent boy who was so mistreated. We feel for him and how things could have been so different if people had given a shit because he actually seems like a really nice kid you know and it's just really sad to watch but then we then see Starger with his first victim and you can tell that this is kind of the early stages because there's a puppy 
the dog is a puppy. So you know that, you know, this is a different stage of his life. And it's very messy. You can tell he has no idea what he's really doing. And like when he talks to Catherine here again, he seems a little bit frazzled by him, bit unsure where she's there. And then he explains about the baptism. As he's discussing his baptism, he's kind of looks like he's caught in this one between the demon version of uh, Starger and the child version of Starger. He's very crouched over. His hair is covering his face. There's no confidence in what he's saying. He's sad. You can see it's upset him. You can see it's had, you know, it's done a number on him. And then he stands up and he kind of turns as he goes into the darkness, he comes out of the darkness as this demon version. And this demon version has a lot of ease. He's very light on his feet. He's very confident. He looks strong. And this is then when we see him kind of take Catherine over, place the thing around her neck, and he's now captured her. The craziest of all the Stargers, in my opinion, and that is King Starger. Now, Catherine is gone. She is in too deep. So Novak is going to do the honourable thing and go in and try and bring her out. But it really does take a sick, sinister turn. If it can get any worse, it really does. Like King Starger, boy, does this man have serious airs and graces about himself when they're in his mind. Like when we see demon, the demon Starger, he's, you know, he seems very strong and confident and stuff like that. And whereas when we see this one, He's, his costume is very over the top. It's very royal-esque. His colours are very big, the colours of gold. And he talks very soft here. And it's, again, very childlike, but more excitement. Whereas when we see serial killer Carl in this, the outside Carl, his is more kind of like fear and upset and anger about what happened to him. Whereas this guy, to me, this version, the King version is like completely gone. Catherine's gone. She has this strange look on her face with this smile, this very strange smile as she sits in this really peculiar way. Catherine then helps Starger capture Novak because he's gone in. Now, she uses her sexuality to gain control over Novak. Now, there was a little part of me that was like, why are you falling for this? But he does. So she lays it on. He goes for it. Now he's knee deep in shit. And she's uh, showing no signs of helping him. And while Novak is on again, this slab thing, she just sits there, watches him it, and kind of the way she is, um, the way she's looking, it reminded me a bit of the way Princess Leia sits when she's with Jabba the Hutt, kind of to the side, but obviously Leia's a bit more with it at the time. So Catherine has been captured too by Stugger, but different, but in a different way. And we see then, oh, he does this weird thing. He's like, you know, when you go to like a barbecue or something and there's a pig on a roasting thing uh hog roast hog roast that's what it's called and so he has one of these but with spikes on it and he wraps Novak's intestines around it and then pulls them out slowly so it's really sick but but the kind of you know the the thing we're seeing now which makes it even more scary is why he's doing that Starger King Starger is gone he is loving this and he's kind of dancing in his steps. He's almost giddy about what's going on, like the way he moves his hands, the way he moves his body, the way he looks. It is by far the most terrifying version because I I feel with this version, it's the one that you could never get through to. Like he's so far gone here. And while I do, as I've mentioned, love this film, I think even if you didn't, you'd have to appreciate what they have done with the set designs and the costume designs, like from a uh, Iko Ishiaka she worked on the movie, uh, on this movie, and she also worked on stuff like Dracula, Mirror Mirror, and Bjork. And if you've seen those things, Bjork uh, music videos, if you've seen those things, you've probably seen that like, there's quite outrageous costumes and stuff, like quite big. And so there's that certain style. But with Catherine, they really did play a lot with the use of colour, depending on what she was actually doing at the time. Like in the opening scene, as I mentioned with Edward, she's looked very angelic. She's dressed in white. She's there to save him. She has his best interests at heart. Her intentions are pure. But we also see here like a very use of um, strong use of red. It's almost like a blood red. And this is the suit that they obviously use when they're suspending Catherine, like why she's going under. But also this is in used in Starger's mind because when she's lost her way she becomes very sexy she's in this red outfit and it's you know she's his toy to do his bidding but because of his arrogance he's not paying any attention to her and Novak does manage to get into her head and she stabs Starger because he thinks she's mine now there's no way basically she's or he or he doesn't care or he's completely unaware because the guy 
is so far gone. So as Novak gets out of this situation, he does piece together where Julia is from certain things he sees down in the mind. And his mission is to go find her while Catherine is to go back to young Carl. So she, of course, goes against protocol. And instead of going into his mind, she brings him into hers because she just can't leave the boy behind. And this whole next scene is probably really important as we see Catherine taking another route to save Carl. Because up until this moment, it hasn't really gone very well. The way they've been doing it hasn't worked. We then see Catherine as a nun. Granted, the red outfit that she's in is a bit unorthodox, but she's a nun. And Carl, bless him, he wants to stay with her. Like, she's very peaceful to be around. And, you know, she she's probably the only person that's ever really cared about him. And, you know, he wants to hold on to that as much as he can. But we also go to, like, the outside Carl that we know and he's also really calm as well and the whole scene is very bright and it's beautiful and we get to see Carl be before he became Starger as he speaks about how he showed mercy to a bird that was dying he killed it because he didn't want his father to find it because he knew that the father would kill it in a more evil way so it kind of shows you that there was something there at one point for this guy and then it just all went and he became you know, the demon, demon king eventually and, um, sorry, the demon Starger and King Starger. So, you know, there may have been a chance with this lad at some point, but as we move to the, to the more evil side of him, the room ob obviously represents that and it goes darker and the virginal looking Catherine changes into a warrior because she now has to take him down and he has this like nipple clamp on and she pulls it from him and it's pretty brutal, I have to say. And she beats the shit out of him. And, you know, she wants to save young Carl. And then it goes back to the brightness and the nun again. So it's very, what we're seeing is very representative of what she's actually doing at the time. He wants to be saved. He asks her and she does. And she does it again with a baptism. But unlike the last time, this is all very calm. It's done to save him. And the last 10, 15 minutes of this film are, are they're really intense as we go between Novak trying to save Julia, Carl being released through baptism, Starger dying. It's a lot to watch. And it's also sad how we see like this little boy who never stood a chance and he's now free. It's quite upsetting to watch, actually. But one thing I got at the end of this film that I did really need, we got the survivor in the end. Unfortunately, while Carl, you know, he didn't survive to go on and live this life with someone like Catherine, but he was released from the hell he was in. So sometimes when you watch films, obviously you don't always get a survivor, which I'm okay with, but I feel like with this film, because everything that's gone on, you needed it. And Julia gives us that. Granted, it's very last minute, but they do hunt her down and she's like managed to break away one of the pipes to get some air from it. And she's drowning. And Again, I suppose that's one of the things about being taken prisoner. What if your captor dies? Then obviously you die, especially when you're in the surroundings that she's in. But I loved that how when Novak did finally get to her, that they both just sat there soaking wet. She's on his lap. He's comforting her. She was so close to dying. He knew that she was so close to dying and he might not have made it in time. And this embrace is like almost something that they both needed. They Like he'd been on a roller coaster, she'd been on a roller coaster and finally they come to some sort of end and they also know that the serial killer you know he can't hurt anyone else and that's the one thing about Novik you can tell he really does care and he goes above and beyond to help but to round all this movie up it is a bit of a roller coaster as I said and you definitely go through all the emotions that's my take on the cell and I hope you enjoyed it and now I have a little podcast promo and that is from Catherine from A Few Bad Apples You've heard the metaphor, one bad apple spoils the bunch. With today's policing practices, the media highlights more bad apple stories than good. There have been several police shootings and instances where officers use excessive force, causing death or injuries to the victims involved. Why does this happen so often? Why hasn't there been change? Will police violence ever end? These are just some of the questions I explore in my bi-weekly true crime podcast, A Few Bad Apples, hosted by me, Dr. Katherine Sheffield. Join me in season three, where I continue to share the research of so many heartbreaking stories of victims who have been physically harmed or murdered by police. 
The premise of the show was not to spark an anti-police movement, but rather a movement of reform. The victims' stories will be the catalyst to promote the change we need that is long overdue. A Few Bad Apples is a part of Crawlspace Media Network and is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And I'd like to say, make sure you go check out Catherine's podcast. I've heard it a few times myself and it's really good. And don't forget to rate and review her on iTunes. And I'd like to say thanks for listening to this episode. And you can also rate and review on iTunes. And if you want more updates, reviews, and behind the scenes, you can go to Instagram as Once Upon a Nightmare podcast, Twitter as a Nightmare pod, Facebook as Once Upon a Nightmare or email as once upon a nightmare pod.com. And I will chat to you again very soon. Bye. The Pod Breed Network is strictly for the small podcasts that are up and coming in the vast world of podcasting. Pod Breed is made up of many diverse podcasts coming together to achieve the same goal of being the best damn podcast network on the planet. Find out more at podbreed.com.